You mentioned a Sunday school teacher. Tell us about the influence of the church on your, on your life. Well, my father was the, uh, he was a deacon, and he also was the, uh, a trustee. He was chairman of the finance committee, mm. which I always found interesting. <laughs> he was in, worked with Southern Aid Insurance Company, and I said, well, you know, why are you the one that's always asking for the money mm. <laughs> in Sunday mornings? And he would explain that. Um, the church was very heavily influencing in my life. Uh, we all had to go to Sunday school. We all had to go to church. Um, and we all understood the, uh, the role of the church. Uh, I remember so vividly, uh, as some people still recall, every Sunday morning there was a group that sang on the radio called uh, Wings Over Jordan. And they would sing that theme song, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, uh, coming for the Carry Me Home. So the church would remind us of where we were in terms of our social structure. And the minister, as politely as he could, would speak to the need for uplifting and the need for curtailing and also the need for moving past from where we were in ensconced. And so the church molded us, in my judgment, to recognize civility and not be striking out, but at the same time not being satisfied with where you were. So it was an impetus to sort of social engagement, civic engagement? Yes. As a matter of fact, the church would be the place where you would have your meetings. There was no other place to go if you were going to have an NAACP meeting, if you were going to have a, a helping hand meeting, if you were going to talk about how to change the plight of a neighborhood and to contribute to people who are less, who are less fortunate. And I, my older sister was very much interested in NAACP work. And, making certain that young leaders were involved. And it spilled over with me. I remember so vividly, she brought, her group brought Paul Robeson to, uh, to Richmond to speak. I was about uh, 14 or 15. And boy, I just couldn't tell you how impressed I was. Mm. I'm watching this great man. And he looked out into the audience <clears throat> and he said, I have just found out that this audience is segregated. And I had promised I would never appear before another segregated audience. And, I, and he walked off the stage. Really? Left it. 3,000 people sitting in the mosque. And Herford Severide went back and they literally begged him, said, look, we'll have to give these people our money back. We'll, we'll broke. This will break us. And he came back, he said, uh, I don't want to see these people hurt. That is their only reason that I'm coming back. Mm. And then he went on, and he spoke a little bit before he gave his performance, his musical performance. Man, I was enthralled. I said, I'm seeing, sitting here, seeing this great man. And I remember shortly after that, <clears throat> the guys in the barber shop telling me, he said, look, Jackie Robinson's just been brought into baseball. We're going to ride up tomorrow night so we can get to Sunday morning, uh, get the next morning's game. Now, if you, you're small enough to fit in the back, you can ride with us. Mm. I can go with you guys and see Jackie Robinson and went up there. And that was the game in which Enos Slaughter spiked him mm. as he was uh, playing first base and reached over. And all the members of the St. Louis Cardinal Ball Club, which was my team, mm. came out of the dugout with their bats in hand, and the Brooklyn Dodgers came to his rescue. And they stood there, and Jackie just grabbed his ankle, looked, shrugged, shrugged it off, and stayed in the game. I said, wow. And I was disappointed because Eno Slaughter was one of my heroes. Uh -huh. But he ran into and hit a storm in terms of the protests that gathered. So I felt so, so lucky. Paul Robeson, uh, mm. one year, and the very next year, Jackie Robinson. How lucky could a guy be to see those things? Oh, wow.